Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Erica Bakiaki, who is a uh, fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, also senior fellow at the Abigail Adams Institute, where she runs the Wollstonecraft Project. Um, you've also visited at Harvard Law and had a number of other positions, and you have a background in theology and law. Welcome, Erica. Thank you so much, Greg. It's great to be with you. Now, of course, I forgot to mention that you're also the author and editor of a number of books. The most recent book is this one called uh, The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision, which is really, it's I guess it's an intellectual history, really, of uh, the, the women's movement going all the way back to uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. And you know, before I read this book, I didn't really realize, and perhaps most people don't realize, how important of a thinker Mary Wollstonecraft actually was. I mean, I think she's probably the first, I guess, political philosopher of of the family in a way, right? Mm-hmm. Where she attempts to stitch together the importance of kind of, I guess, the private virtues and public virtues. And um, and she's had, I think, a, a profound impact, but one that has been underappreciated. And I think the book tells the story not only of her thinking, but also how you know her thinking led to a bunch of other strands within our political philosophy and within the legal uh, thinking in the last couple centuries, and um, and how I think you're you're calling for a. Um, reclaiming of her legacy, which I think has been somewhat forgotten by the women's movement. So, you know, maybe we can start by just talking about Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, So, you know, first of all, what makes her uh, thought so important? And why is it that you think her thought has been, I guess, underappreciated by people who study intellectual history and political philosophy? Yeah, thanks for that kind setup. Um, yeah, you know, I studied her first as a women's studies student when I was at Middlebury College in the 1990s, um, but only read a, a brief bit of it. And really, at that point, I think within women's studies, she was read as kind of this, you know, proto-feminist who um, really had a lot to say about education. But at that time, since we're sort of, you know, she was brought into the sort of women's studies canon by well, women's studies professors, um, her a lot of her, the grounding of her thought. So her religiosity, um, her interest in sort of virtue, um, and we would now say virtue ethics, since that's very much a part of sort of the academy now, was really, I think, um, pushed to the side. And, and really, there was just an interest in how she talked about sort of rights and education and all of that. So, um, as a you know basic background, she um, wrote in the in the late 1700s. So she's an 18th, 18th century thinker um, and died at a at a pretty young age. Um, she died in childbirth um, uh, and um, wrote quite a bit though before then. She was the oldest of a fairly big family. She had kind of a tumultuous upbringing. Um, you know, heard her father kind of abuse abusing her mother, raping her mother, etc. Um, so. Then um, her father was alcoholic, kind of had to care for her younger siblings. Um, She had to rescue one of her sisters from an abusive marriage. Um, She had another friend who, a very, very close friend of hers who died in childbirth. I mean, she really was up and against sort of the um, the ways in which women's lack of rights at that time um, and really sort of being treated much kind of as akin to property within marriage, at least, um, was uh, she she sort of was running up against that in her own personal life. Um, she was an uh, self-trained, so um, you know, was incredibly well read um, and had many, many teachers along the way um, who who were really um, kind of fundamental to to shaping her thought, I would say. Um, we could talk about many of those. But when she was a pretty young woman, she opened a, a school. In Newington Green, um, where a, a very controversial statue has been erected of her <laughs> recently, um, and and then uh, you know fell into the congregation. She was an Anglican by practice at that point. Um, wrote an important book um, on the education of daughters, uh, uh, um, a really incredible book that that really was found more recently in the last couple of decades. Uh, the female reader, where she 
um, has these four beautifully, deeply Christian prayers, which people don't sort of recognize about her, but then also is writing for kind of the edification of young women. So she has a bunch of Shakespeare and Milton, a bunch from the Bible, and she's basically trying to help women um, not succumb to sort of having men think for them, that she wants women to think on their own and be formed really uh, morally and intellectually so that they can be kind of independent of mind. Um, and she's especially interested really in um, in the institution of marriage and how it um, really was um, that women, because they had no you know training, education and anything else, they sort of um, were, uh, you know, meant and preparing themselves their whole young life for marriage. Uh, and if they didn't luck out there, well, they may, you know, end up having to be prostitutes or some other sort of thing. So informing themselves to be married, they very much were interested in kind of appearances. And she really said, you know, even within marriage, like we've, we, you know, because of the important role of a wife, of a mother, especially in kind of inculcating virtue, um, in being a companion to one's husband, one has to be educated intellectually and morally and really formed. Um, she said, you know, the most important work of life is kind of formation and virtue. And that's something that many people just didn't, don't know about her, <laughs> this, um, this kind of background because of her really important book of Indication of the Rights of Women, which is really what's read, what's, um, explored. She also had a book called The Vindication of the Rights of Men, where she is criticizing um, Burke and his defense of the English monarchy. So she's kind of positioned against him within the French Revolution. And I think that's also a much more complicated story there as well. So anyway, that's kind of her background. I mean, the last thing to mention, too, is her personal life, because it's something that I don't know what, what it is about kind of being a woman writer, but for some reason, the personal life of of women um, is, you know, picked apart much more than kind of the life of someone like Rousseau, who, by the way, was her chief interlocutor in the Vindication of the Rights of Men. I mean, uh, sorry, the Vindication of the Rights of Women. He, you know, had five children with a mistress and put them in orphanages, but we don't really hear that of the man who wrote this, you know, famous treatise on children's education, right? But we hear about Wollstonecraft, who had all sorts of these beautiful kind of um, things to say about sort of um, equal dignity within marriage, the deep friendship of equals within marriage, that both men and women are um, really called and expected and should be expected to care for children because of how important that work is, motherhood and fatherhood. Um, and as you said, sort of the work of the family being what undergirds um, the public virtue, which I think all of us would like to see more of <laughs> these days. Um, so so I think um, all of that is, is uh, sort of lays the ground for her thought, but then, um, she has kind of these, a couple of tumultuous relationships of her own where, you know, her first, she imagines her, him, him to be this kind of new man who she imagined, yet he runs off with other women. Um, she is in great despair. She's um, had, a, had a baby. Um, she, I think, is probably suffering from so, some postpartum depression, but who knows? And she attempts suicide two different times um, and kind of calling him back to her, which he never does return. She then ends up um, married to the anarchist William Godwin. Um, and is it's a very short-lived marriage because she's pregnant before they marry. They then um, She then dies in childbirth. And he goes on to write this um, biography of hers, of her. And it's really, I think <laughs> it's um, one that is, that has sort of shaped immediate thought of her and um, uh, for, for, for great ill at that point. Uh, I think he really misunderstood her. And so it's only in the last probably 30 to 40 years you've seen women political theorists, women now with a new theologian has written this incredible book um, who have really tried to reclaim her thought out from under her personal life. So you've got those kind of on the conservative end who bemoan her, you know, uh, childbearing outside of marriage. Then you have those uh, who really, you know, lionize her childbearing out of marriage and think of her as this free love thinker. She really is much more complex than any of that. And so it's been really beautiful, I think, to see um, both women and some men, political theorists, historians, again, theologians, um, begin to take seriously and really read her whole, the entire canon uh, or the entire um, corpus of her. And uh, I've been really grateful to, to learn from many of them. Yeah. And I think what I found interesting is that, you know, she emphasized the importance of the family and the family unit, in particular, the the married couple as forming the basis for uh, the, the good society, right? And for um, 
political liberty and rights and so forth. But at the same time, there are other people that did that said this, but for them, they really saw this as flowing from kind of a a division of labor, right? <laughs> Where it was the, the women that were responsible for the, the private realm and the men that were responsible for the, for the public realm. And she, she said that um, those roles should not be so clearly divided, right? I think that was really what made her unique was a combination of those two things, right? So, yeah, that's so right. So maybe tell a little bit, I mean, with respect to the first, I mean, there were others that were recognizing the importance of of the family. I mean, you talk about de Tocqueville, right? And how mm-hmm. de Tocqueville made these observations about um, about America, right? Yeah, that's right. So, of course, Tocqueville is, what, like 50 years after Wollstonecraft and his observations of America. What's fascinating about her relationship with America <laughs> is that um, her teacher, Richard Price, was very conversant with many of the American founders. And so she was actually um, in his congregation exactly when Abigail and John Adams were. And so he really, you know, um, Richard Price was this real um, sort of uh, a champion of the American Revolution, um, in part because of what he hoped would be kind of the advance of freedom and virtue together. And if you know, for those who have read, you know, the founders, especially John Adams, but others too, there's a real understanding that this is an experiment in ordered liberty and really, you know, the individual Republican citizens, smaller Republican citizens, of course, need to be living um, virtuous lives, that you can't have political self-government without personal self-government. And so she was very much in that kind of line of thought. Um, And so Abigail Adams would go on to call herself Wollstonecraft's pupil. So she really is kind of this I think American thinker in a lot of ways, but you're absolutely right. There were thinkers, um, you know, who Tocqueville actually learned quite a bit from. Um, uh, I doubt he read Wollstonecraft, but he certainly read Rousseau and he read Locke, um, and and those Enlightenment thinkers too were were you know really um, thinking a lot about the 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 importance of family relationships. But I would say, especially with Locke and Rousseau, you have very different ideas of. Um, the family and include and Burke too. You know, if you see a if you see sort of um, Burke as the kind of conserver of um, tradition of English traditions, who really sees a very gendered account of virtue. Same with Rousseau. And and really, if Burke is her interlocutor in vindication of the rights of men, Rousseau is her interlocutor in vindication of the rights of women. And she's really anxious to say, um, you know, why you know she's sort of pushing back. Um, about on and thinking and talking with them, really discussing with them virtue. Yes, she agrees with them that virtue must underlie government, right? Um, and society and personal relations and public relations. Absolutely. And we have all sorts of great quotes we could share with you where she says that, that really people have to be formed virtuously in the family in order to go out um, into the public sphere and do anything worthwhile. Um, but she's, she's, really contesting their their gendered account of virtues, both with Burke and Rousseau. And why is that? And what's fascinating about her is that she goes to a source that maybe some feminists wouldn't expect, but I think is really, you know, a quite um, a compelling source, which is, um, is uh, what she calls the perfection of God. She says, I build my morality on the perfection of God. So what she wants to do is say, just like Martin Luther King did, just like the writers of Seneca Falls are at Seneca Falls of the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions do, they say, we want to go to kind of a natural justice. We want to look at how um, the perfection of God, the goodness of God, the justice of God informs these kinds of questions. And she says, if it's the goodness of God, then really, and that's what we're imitating. Like that's what human beings, when they seek the good, they're really, they're yearning after kind of the goodness of God, some higher good. And so we have to, you know, um, order ourselves accordingly. And God is one, she says, and God is, you know, though we, of course, she even talks about the fatherhood of God and all that. Virtue must then be required of men. All the virtues must be required of men and women. And so what she says is we don't want this gendered account where women are expected to be modest and chaste and pure and men are expected to be just and courageous and, you know, other kinds of intellectual virtues, really men should be required and expected to be modest and chaste <laughs> and um, women should be expected to be just and courageous and all that. So we want the whole panoply of virtues. Why? Because human, because women, just like men, are rational creatures created by and responsible to God. And so in order to live full human lives and then in order to be great mothers, 
great wives, great participants in society, great, as she says, fellow creatures, right? Um, they need to have all the virtues. And she means both the moral and intellectual virtues. She wants robust, um, rigorous education for women so they can develop their minds to their capacities. And she also wants physical, physical you know, development of women too, so they can become strong in both mind, um, heart, character, and their bodies as well. So she, she basically said that men and women are sexed in their bodies, but, but not in their souls, right? I think. Yeah. That was... So that's a, yeah, she says it's unphilosophical to talk about the soul as sexed. And this is kind of an older account. Um, Rousseau has a very sexed account of the soul, right? That there's almost like two different human species. There's like the female soul and the male soul. And, um, and they're so incredibly different. And I think what's, here's an important distinction for Wollstonecraft is that the soul is rational and unsexed, but the soul and body are very much knit together. So she's not a Cartesian. And that's a really important thing. There's not this way in which kind of the soul like is the person and carries around the body like a briefcase or something, <laughs> you know, the soul and the body influence each other. You could say all the way down and all the way up. And so she'd say, Virtue is, is you know, um, uh, sexless in some sense, right? Everybody should, all men and women should seek to acquire all the virtues, but their duties may be different, she says. Why might their duties be different? Their responsibilities might be different because of the bodies they are, right? And so because of motherhood and fatherhood, you know, um, uh, sort of requiring of us different kinds of responsibilities because of, well, what mothers and fathers are, right? The way in which women reproduce inside themselves and men reproduce outside themselves. And there are different kinds of responsibilities that come with that. She acknowledges that the virtues may look different in a man and a woman, very much so. But she doesn't, you know, but the goal of having virtues, um, of having the whole panoply of virtues is very much the same because it is just being fully human. Yeah, now, not to skip too far ahead, but I mean, w when I was reading about Justice Ginsburg, right, and her sort of political philosophy, in particular, sort of in, in the earlier part of her political philosophy, I mean, it, it seemed remarkably consistent with what Wollstonecraft was was advocating. Yeah, so I think that's right. One of the things I say is that by um, by really fighting for women to be understood as equal citizens, Wollstonecraft, uh, sorry, Ginsburg is basically constitutionalizing Wollstonecraft's principle, right? That we shouldn't just, I mean, what Wollstonecraft, what, excuse me, what Ginsburg is fighting against in the 1970s as a, you know, advocate for the ACLU is she's saying, you know, we shouldn't have these laws that basically confine women to maternity that expect that if just because a woman has the capacity for childbirth, has the capacity for motherhood, she should be kept out of professions. And that was, I think, a really important, you know, gain and a really important um, uh, sort of, you're right, kind of underlying political philosophy. The problem I have with Ulstercraft, and I have these kind of two back-to-back -back chat, sorry, the problem I have with Ginsburg, <laughs> and I have these two back-to-back -back chapters, is, um, is that I think she actually has a very Lockean view of citizenship. And I didn't get to that when I was talking about, you know, how those those Enlightenment thinkers thought about um, citizenship. But for Locke, there's a way in which, and Locke is really the premier kind of liberal, you know, um, political theorist who um, gives, I think, our founders an account of what citizenship looks like. I mean, certainly Blackstone and others. Um, and so virtue is, of course, necessary. But there's this erect, but when sort of liberal citizens, so that's white propertied men, enter into um, you know, civil society and form a government by the consent of the governed, they leave women behind, right? They leave women in the private sphere. And so we have this, so, so with liberal sort of philosophy, Locke and Locke's philosophy, there's this erection of the private and public spheres. And so women are there to sort of care for, do the really important work of nurturing those Republican citizens. And that's where you get understandings of Republican motherhood, and all that when you come into the early time in the Amer after the American Revolution, it's a, this sort of high calling. It's not women are not just kind of child bearers or, you know, there for sort of the sexual pleasure of men or whatever, or property, whatever. Now women have this high task. And that's what Tocqueville notices, right, that American women take very seriously their work of nurturing and caring for their children, especially, you know, these sons who will go on to become Republican citizens. The trouble is when, you know, when you have this kind of liberal view of citizenship, where you kind of need to be autonomous from caregiving, when you try to bring women into that, there's this way in which you 
prize autonomy, prize independence above all, and then you kind of leave children behind. And so I think that's sort of Ginsburg, as much as I admire so much of Ginsburg's work early on, especially, I think that's her underlying view of citizenship, that it is based on autonomy. Um, this is a view that really much of the Western tradition has had, um, uh, that, you know, you need to have kind of, you need to be independent. You need to be, well, at some point back then you had to be land owning, owning you know, so that you could kind of think clearly uh, about what it is to engage in Republican government. And I think that was a real, uh, you know, trick for her to do that. And what it ended up, I think, having her prize um, abortion rights, um, you know, at the very kind of pinnacle of her thought. Right. I mean, not to summarize the book too much, but it, it seems like the, there are, you know, two possible paths that the women's right movement could, could have taken. One, which would offer up a, a, a vision, which sort of, you know, combined the best aspects of these two different versions of virtue. And another, which sort of, pursued kind of the, the, the male vision of, of, of virtue, right? Um, and I think you're arguing that maybe we've gone too far in the latter direction and we need to go more in the former direction. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right, sort of the, the older traditional account of masculine virtue. But I think there's a way it's not just kind of masculine virtue. I think it's also a lot of sort of... Um, uh, due to industrialization and capitalism and the rise of kind of a liberal understanding of the person that I don't see that as really masculine virtue. I see that as kind of yeah. capitalist virtues. And so it's pushing yeah. men to live lives where, you know, they're sort of choosing, consuming um, autonomous beings, which they have an easier time living that out <laughs> because they can kind of leave children um, to the side for women to take care of or whatever. They can, you know, you know, strive to, uh, to accumulate goods and have own property and, 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 and make lots of money in the workplace. Um, and I think that's the way they've gone. Um, and then women kind of jump on in liberal feminism to kind of imitate that way of being. I tend to think that that's just not a great understanding of virtue, or it's just a very anorexic understanding of virtue. Certainly, there's some great virtues of being really good at your job and working hard and having kind of industriousness and all of that. And I think both men and women, you know, should do that in whatever realm they inhabit. But I think there's all sorts of other virtues um, that come out of different parts of what it is to be human. So we're deeply inter interdependent, right? We're deeply relational. We're familial beings, right? So I think... Um, you know, just as I think really good men have always seen that their work outside the home is to kind of make sure that the work inside the home, you know, can um, be cared for and all of that. I think a big shift happens and we can kind of discuss this, but with industrialization, the rise of um, uh, rise of capitalism, where women start to become far more dependent, where they used to work together in the agrarian homestead, right? women start to become far more dependent and that dependency puts them at great risk, right? Um, because they now depend on men for a paycheck. If you have a virtuous husband, maybe that works really well for you. If you don't, or your husband abandons you or you never marry or whatever, that becomes a much more risky ordeal for women. And so it's not just women's ambition that sent them into the workplace. It's a real, you know, desire to have some sort of, you know, insurance against, I think, male, um, male vice in, in a lot of ways, which is what you saw um, in that first well, wave of feminism. Yeah, I mean, all these debates play out, of course, in the legal domain, in the legislative mm -hmm. domain. And, That's right. you know, you go back to the law of, of coverture, right? And you, you say, well, coverture wasn't really a, as big of a problem in the kind of agricultural world as it became in, in the industrial world. And what I found fascinating is how you know, the, the themes of these debates, they, they, they seem to be the same over these centuries. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when everyone began to see the problem with coverture, there were um, two alternatives. One was kind of separate property and one was, was, was joint property. And we kind of decided to go the, the separate property route. So how does that debate sort of kind of capture a, a lot of the themes that we're still discussing today? Yeah, no, that's a really great question um, and does get into the weeds of one of my favorite chapters of the book, which is chapter five. Um, I mean, four and five, I guess, together when I'm really discussing sort of 
there's a lot of legal history in there. Um, and so for those who you know don't know uh, their legal history as well as you do, so coverture is basically the common law sort of approach um, that uh, William Blackstone and his commentaries on the law of England kind of write into existence. And that's the that's the legal backdrop of the constitution because the common law is what um, was taken up by the American founders. So it's English law. Um, and you know, there's some debate, um, I think, and I think I'd love to see more scholarship on this about whether Blackstone and kind of putting that in black and white ends up really um, enacting it more, especially in a Puritan, sorry, a Puritan setting um, where you've got scriptural kind of, um, uh, ways in which you can sort of see, you know, men and women are one in being when they marry and that that one in being is the man. <laughs> you could also, as you're saying, could think of that differently. You could think men and women are one in being and that one in being is the marriage, you know, um, and I think those are two very different ways of thinking about it. It really is kind of the common law way of thinking about it, that this, that the being in the existence, the legal existence of the woman is suspended during marriage. I'm now quoting um, and she's incorporated and consolidated into the husband. And so it's under whose wing protection and cover. That's where that cover, coverture comes for cover. So she's under the cover. And the idea of this in the common law is that men would be responsible to care for and nurture and um, provide for their wives. And so there's this important responsibility that men have. But in more of the civil law tradition, you see something different. And that's coming out of Germany. But also in Louisiana, you have a much more kind of understanding of the shared um, ownership of everything. And this is much more in keeping with actually how things were, as you mentioned, and I mentioned before, um, prior to industrialization, right? So think of the kind of agrarian homestead. Most of America was agrarian, most of England was agrarian, um, or you had kind of, you know, um, women working alongside men, sure, more in the home than out, and men were more outside the home in the fields, but they were very much cooperative and collaborative and all that. And so there's a push um, very early on. In fact, we always think of the first wave of the women's movement in the mid you know, um, 19th century, so mid 1800s as being all about suffrage. Well, suffrage comes way later. <laughs> the very first thing that comes um, about is a real push for, well, two things. We can talk about voluntary motherhood, but the first one is really joint property ownership. And that's what you mentioned. And that's basically this idea that men and women, you know, they're putting all their, you know, productivity into the home. And so they should share in um, their kind of economic responsibility of the home. And so what happens in um, separate property and separate property is actually what gets pushed ahead. So the early women's rights advocates weren't so successful with joint property. In fact, we didn't have joint property ownership until like the 1970s and 1980s. So it's like a year, a hundred years later, what happens is you have kind of um, uh, legislatures passing separate property ownership, which is basically to say, like, if a woman brings property into the marriage, or if she owns, or if she earns her own wages, then she has title to those. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, if you think about, not many women were, you know, earning their own wages. The productive work they were doing was inside the home. So joint property just makes so much more sense. But you're right. There's a way in which those push forward. I mean. There's debates and I, I um, kind of catalog and, and um, show these debates through industrialization where you have kind of, you know, those people like Alice Paul uh, following John Stuart Mill, who, by the way, was a big advocate of separate property ownership in, um, in England. Uh, you have them arguing like, look, women need equal contract rights. And that makes sense to all of us now, right? Of course, women need equal contract rights. And so those people were very much, well, I should say Alice Paul was very much behind, very much um, in favor of the Lochner decision. This is an infamous decision now, right? <laughs> where, where the court in 1905 struck down regulations um, uh, uh, for, um, to, to keep men bakers at that point from working more than I think 10 hours a day. And so, mm -hmm. you know, Alice Paul is all in favor of that because she says, good, contract rights, liberty of contract, because that's how they decided it. Well, then you have this kind of Wollstonecraftian strand, which is Florence Kelly, who basically says liberty of contract is a total legal, legal fiction. You know, if women are competing with men in the workplace, how are they going to take care of their children? How are they going to take care of the family mm -hmm. um, and all that? So there's, yes, competing strands. And those run right up now to debates over the ERA, um, which is Alice Paul initially is, you know, the one who was the the draft uh, the um author of the ERA. So do we want strict equality for men and women? 
Or do we think that there are women have special responsibilities because of their capacity for childbirth? And so, and, you know, many women desiring to care for um, young children, infants in the home, young children. And so should there be special kind of either protections or special allowances for women in, in the workplace? And these are debates, as you say, that are going on right now. Yeah, you know, I mean, I remember Lochner, of course, from from con law, but I, I don't remember uh, Mueller versus Oregon, right, which is is just as, as significant, right, because it, it sort of cre- creates a carve out, right, from from Lochner, where, you know, it's perfectly fine when it comes to uh, regulating contract when uh, when gender is involved. right? <laughs> so um, so that that there's that whole debate, whether right. it was. Um, it was okay to pass legislation that specifically targeted women as long as it had some kind of protective uh, motivation, that's right. right? Yeah, that's so, right. So, you know, with Lochner, the idea was, as I understand it, um, there were these, you know, large established bakeries that, that wanted to keep the kind of small uh, bakeries from competing. <laughs> so they, they, they put the, the hour uh, rules in place. And, and, you know, a lot of the, the feminists at the time argued that these rules were essentially making it more difficult for women to, to compete with men. Right. Uh, and so th- they opposed these protections, but there were others that said, no, 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 like women need this, this protection. And, and you do see this same debate kind of That's right. uh, happening later when we, we talk about, you know, providing maternity leave as opposed to providing, you know, a parental leave. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's great. Lochner, I mean, is one of those cases that has been really, you know, sort of there's an understanding of it and then there's a new understanding of it and more historical evidence comes about. And so, yeah, I think your your take of it is how it's understood today. Um, but at the beginnings, it was understood just as labor protections, you know, like yeah. we just want to protect these bakers. <laughs> I think more has come out since then. Yeah. And so you talk about the, the voluntary motherhood movement. Um, and what I found fascinating about this is this also, right, could be seen as sort of the... Um, kind of ancestral or, you know, the origins of both the, the, the anti-abortion movement and the kind of pro-abortion rights movement. Yeah. It's so interesting with voluntary motherhood because there are, I would say, um, those who have kind of, uh, see it as their own, like their own inheritance. And I, so let me spell that out. So voluntary motherhood, like joint property ownership is one of the most basic, claims, arguments that those first wave um, women's rights advocates are making. So way prior to suffrage, right? Way pri- and, and, and I mean, yes, property rights, contract rights, all of those at the same time. But it's an argument because of the nature of coveture that they're saying, look, you know, within marriage, men um, have this kind of whether it's a, you know, because of interpretations of scripture at the time, because of interpretations of coveture, even another common law doctrine called consortium, where, you know, women owe their services to men, that there's an idea that men basically have a right to engage, kind of have a sexual prerogative to um, sex within marriage, we're talking about within marriage, but that they can just, you know, take women, take their wives whenever they want. And so there's a lot of pushback against that. And so what these women say, and this is really fascinating, I think, for people who just sort of think of feminism in the terms that we have today, that they just assume kind of women have always been, or sorry, I should say feminists have always been kind of for abortion rights. What's fascinating about these women, and this is some, goes from some of the more Christian women all the way to the more radical women. So some radical women like uh, Victoria Woodhull, especially incredibly radical, um, but they all understood uh, that you know, a new human being was um, created in, uh, you know, pregnancy and that women, when they were pregnant, owe duties of care to their children. And so what they're saying is that, look, if we're the ones who have this kind of disproportionate burden in pregnancy, then we're the ones who have a right to determine when and under what circumstances we have sex, right? So we engage in that act that could make us a mother. So we talk about voluntary motherhood, it's voluntarily engaging in the act, sex, that could make one a mother. And so what they argue for is actually kind of a periodic abstinence, which, you know, they try to have all sort of different, you know, techniques to do this, but their science wasn't very advanced at the time. So it's basically by like mutual decision, if you have a husband who's on board or unilateral decision of the woman, because they're trying to kind of harmonize and equalize what 
I refer to as these asymmetries, reproductive asymmetries, which is basically that women and men engage in the same sexual act, but it's women who carry this disproportionate burden, but of course, also the privilege of, of having a child. And so they're asking, they're calling upon men to have habits of chastity. And it's very similar to what Wollstonecraft um, in 1792 in her vindication of the rights of women is, is, is asking men for as well. So one of the suffragist slogans was votes for women, chastity for men. And so you see, and I think it's helpful actually to just, let me just quote um, Victoria Woodhull because this language is like, for those who don't know this history, it's kind of like, whoa, they said that? <laughs> so she, you know, um, she says, uh, this is in 1970. And this is very interestingly for me as a legal scholar, for you as a lawyer is right around the ratification of the 14th amendment, right? And so what's fascinating, fast forward to when in the 1970s, and 80s and later, you have, you know, 1970s and pro-choice feminists arguing that the 14th Amendment should allow for, has kind of built in there in the Liberty Clause or even, you know, um, Equal Protection Clause, you know, protection for abortion rights. You have, an, you have back when that clause is ratified, you have all the women who are in this women's rights movement saying things like this. So here's Victoria Woodhill. Again, so she's really interesting because she's this outspoken advocate for constitutional equality for women. She's the first woman to run for president on the Equal Rights Party platform. She's the first woman to testify before Congress. Um, she's pretty radical in a lot of ways. Um, and she talks about in a piece on children's rights, she says these rights begin while yet they remain the fetus. So here's her kind of very like, whoa, she says many women who would be shocked at the very thought of killing their children after birth deliberately destroy them previously. If there's any difference in the actual crime, we should be glad to have those who practice the latter, that's abortion, pointed out. The truth of the matter is, it, it, is that it is just as much a murder to destroy life in its embryonic condition as it is to destroy life after the fully developed form is attained, for it is the self-same life that is taken. And so just kind of a final word on this, their view was not only that that women as mother, as when they became mothers, so when they're pregnant, owe these duties of care to their developing children. They also believed that any type of kind of allowances for abortion or, um, you know, seeing abortion as kind of not a big deal would kind of tilt the playing, the sexual playing field further in the male direction. Why? Because it would allow men to kind of take women and then have the excuse of having abortion in the background. And this is exactly what, well, I think ends up happening in the 1970s where, you know, there's kind of this um, way in which abortion allows for um, a casual sex culture to come about where, you know, women who would prefer to wait for commitment, which is, you know, at least studies show us that women prefer sex within commitment. There's sort of a change that happens in those sexual mores because abortion is then available and, um, you know, is there for the taking if um, women should end up pregnant. Yeah, and you, you spend some time kind of on the intellectual history of the abortion rights movement. And I think it, it, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't predetermined, right? So the founders of Planned Parenthood were actually um, anti-abortion and the National Organization of Women was not uh, all about abortion rights until later. And, and you talked about how the, it was really kind of a marriage of, of the, I guess, the, the eugenicists, right? And how that was, the eugenicists were the ones that were originally the, the, the advocates of, of abortion rights. Um, so what, what, when did that kind of shift happen where um, the women's rights movement went from being sort of uh, anti-abortion to pro-abortion rights? Yeah, this is, I think, really fascinating history. So one of the things that you know, while at the very, you know, just about when women are ob obtaining suffrage, that's 1920 with the 19th Amendment, you then in the next decade have, you know, Fr Franklin Delano Roosevelt bringing a ton of those women, while well, the women that were still around into his administration, really putting kind of those labor protections that that many like women like Florence Kelly were fighting for. Um, and you have this push for you know, protections for women in the workplace, but also protections for men. So there's more equality there. Um, you have property rights, you have contract rights pushing forward, right? Well, while this is all happening and you have those, again, voluntary motherhood claims that I was making where there's this expectation of trying to have an expectation of men to kind of meet women at a high standard of care. So instead of having the double standard, 
where, you know, women end up with the consequences of sexual activity and men kind of walk away. They want everyone, these women want, you know, men and women to, to sort of have a high standard of, of kind of sexual integrity and, and, and care for children and all that. Well, right along parallel paths with that, you have the emergence of Margaret Sanger. So Margaret Sanger is a nurse and she is, um, you know, she's working in kind of really poor areas. She sees women having many, many more children that they that they either want or can handle in terms of their bodies. <laughs> and she sees a lot of vicious men, men who aren't willing to kind of be chased or in other words, to, you know, abstain during times. They're they're they're, you know, pushing their sexual appetites on the women. So she is pushing for contraception. And so Planned Parenthood, her organization, is very much first and foremost a pro-contraception anti-abortion outfit. So she's saying like, look, we need contraception in order to make sure that women don't have to go and get these kind of dangerous underground abortions. And she also, frankly, is, you know, at least morally opposed to abortion. And so that's her view. What's fascinating is that you also have her her um, successor, Alan Guttmacher, is present um, during the time later when abortion is being debated. So abortion reform measures are being debated before Roe. Because remember, leading up to Roe, you have abortion restrictions, except for, you know, life of the mother mainly, but some rape and incest. But so there's a push for abortion reform among doctors, especially who are worried about getting their license revoked. Um, and that's a whole complicated issue, but that's who is pushing. Um, it's, it's kind of the doctors pushing for public health. And then it's, it's uh, people who are of kind of Margaret Sanger's ilk who start to see, okay, it's not just contraception who's going to keep kind of the poor. This is the eugenic turn in, in, in Margaret's thought. There's who are going to keep the poor and the unwanted and and um, the de the deplorables. I mean, we have all sorts of language of her being quite a eugenicist going over abroad to test, you know, her test the pill on Haitian women, on disabled women, et cetera, right? So, so there's a push then really after her time, um, of the, the population control advocates and eugenicists to, to say we need abortion because contraception just isn't working. Why is it not working? Because of what happens really is that there's a way in which when, when contraception is taken up, I mean, especially the pill, even before the FDA approves it in 1960, women are like, American women are really wanting this thing, right? And so what ends up happening though, is there's kind of a change in sexual risk taking. So the moral hazard that's present before the pill where so people have this kind of incentive to master their appetites, to, you know, think about who they want to have sex with before. Well, that sort of changes, right? So there's a change in the way people engage in sex, not just within marriage, but then outside of marriage too. And so, I mean, they're especially, frankly, worried about exactly the populations that they wanted contraception for, the poor, especially, you know, people of color, and they you know, think maybe abortion is the way forward instead. And so that's when you have like Larry Later writing his big book, Abortion. You have a lot of population control people really pushing for abortion at that point. What's fascinating is that Planned Parenthood itself, this is Alan Gottmacher, who is the successor to Margaret Sanger. And he says, when abortion is easily available, contraception is neither actively or diligently used. So he's actually worried, look, if you flood, if you sort of open the gates to abortion on demand, which is beginning to be what is requested, then people aren't going to use contraception <laughs> because they're just going to, it's on, you know, it's at that point, it's not very pleasant and all that. So there's this um, sort of fascinating shift that happens then. What I would say, and I think this is kind of the point that I like to make because it works well in sort of understanding conceptually what happens is those Wollstonecraft, those early women's rights advocates, they see that the change that is necessary or the response that is necessary to sexual and reproductive asymmetry, to these differences that in responsibilities um, that kind of befall men and women when it comes to sex and reproduction should be answered with moral and social and legal norms. Right. But what happens with Margaret Sanger and then is that there's this technological shift. And so what ends up happening is you have you have what answers asymmetry now, what answers the fact that men and women can engage in sex, but women get pregnant and men don't is technology. So you have contraception and you have abortion. And when technology kind of fills in the gaps, again, you have this shift so that that's when you see sort of the sexual revolution come about. Right. More sexual risk taking more sort of casual sex um, as sort of a, a sexual ethos um, that, that kind of 
takes over because we're relying now on technology instead of our development of kind of self mastery in the sexual realm. Well, I mean, the, the, the more, the interesting story from a social science perspective, which I think you, you probably could have written a whole another book on this is just, you know, we have these cultural shifts, we have these technological shifts and we have these legal shifts and it, 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 it doesn't seem like there's a, there's a simple, you know, causal model that, that, helps you understand, you know, what's driving what, right? So if, for instance, uh, ease of contraception and, and abortion should presumably reduce the number of unwanted children, reduce the number of, say, children out of, out of, out of wedlock, one would think, but that, that would presume, you know, ceteris paribus, right? But there are all these sort of, um, uh, I guess, you, you know, um, flows that go between those three different domains, which, which lead to some, some unintended consequences. So, That's right. you know, do you have sort of a, a, a causal story here about, um, you know, what's driving what? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, there's a lot of my husband, you know, is uh, in tech and, and went, you know, went to get his MBA at MIT. They talk a lot about systems thinking, system dynamics. And I think there's a lot of that stuff going on here. And it's, sort of really fascinating. I don't think there's a linear story to be tell, but I do think you're right to point out the very counterintuitive um, uh, sort of thing that happens when contraception floods the market and therefore becomes sort of almost necessary. And that's the way that abortion advocates talk about it, is that really with contraception, abortion becomes really necessary as this backstop if you're going to get to the what you wanted with contraception, which is preventing pregnancy, right? And so that's why they kind of go together on both sides in some sense, right? And so these unintended consequences are now with us. <laughs> um, you know, what, what, are, what are sort of, you know, what's the causal story? I think there's a lot of different things going on. There's women entering the workplace um, because of the story I told before, which is with industrialization, with the rise of liberalism, capitalism, there's a, a need for sort of women to have um, a fallback. They can't be utterly economically dependent. They never have been, right? And so it's just not, um, it's it's a dangerous place to be in. I mean, think of any, even conservative fathers who are like, ah, oh, I think you need to get an educate. You need to have some sort of skills. What if your husband leaves? You know what I mean? Like there's, it's just, it puts women in a difficult situation. Even women who want to be home and raise children, like what do they do in that situation? It, you know, you've got to have a man who really, really, you can trust his commitment and trust his promise, right, to take care of you. And so that's a that's a tricky thing, right? And so women enter the workplace for all different sorts of reasons. And so then there's this thing, and this is really fa a fascinating story too, where, you know, at first, as you, men you mentioned, National Organization for Women, I think that's a great place to go here because I absolutely love the National Organization for Women original platform. It was written in 1966. And when you go and find it, online, there's kind of this little, um, this little uh, uh, line under it that says, these are not our current priorities <laughs> of, of the National Organization for Women. What's fascinating is that they talk about in that document, innovating, there's, they're like, we're Americans, we can innovate new social institutions, which can, I'm quoting now, enable women to enjoy true equality of opportunity and responsibility in society without conflict with their responsibilities as mothers. And so they're interested in, they have another place where they want better recognition of, I quote, the economic and social value of homemaking and childcare. Mm -hmm. That is the work of the home that was at that point disproportionately taken by women. And so they want both childcare and they want retraining for women who have dedicated themselves to the work of the home. And so it's just this kind of you know, what ends up happening though, I mean, there's a, like a lot of ratchet effects, right? So you have women entering the workplace, you have women getting all sorts of kind of professional degrees. Then you have something like a sort of mating where you have two professionals marrying each other. You have then all the costs of housing and schooling and all sorts of other things going up. And then you have single mothers, right? Who are like at the bottom of the barrel, especially if you're a person of color who's a single mother, right? Who doesn't have adequate health care and housing and all that. So it's just this um, this kind of incredible thing that sort of happened. A lot of conservatives will blame feminism for that. I think the story is way more complicated, right? And so what ends up happening, fascinating, is right after National Organization for Women puts forward this idea of kind of innovating solutions, like 
kind of trying to find what you would think of now as like family friendly workplaces, places where that takes seriously our responsibilities as mothers. And now we would say as fathers too, instead there's a push for abortion rights and not just abortion rights, but like abortion on demand. And so right away in the very next year, they change their platform and they request abortion on demand. And what I think is problematic about this is that right away, you're sort of you're sort of undercutting exactly what you just claimed you wanted to see, which was that valuing the work of the home. Because right away, you know, and this was actually an argument that was made, as far as I can understand, by this by Larry Later and Bernard Nathanson, both um, big abortion advocates. Bernard Nathanson later becomes, you know, a pro-life advocate. He's an OBGYN. Um, and they basically go to Betty Friedan and, you know, who wanted to have women control their reproduction. But I think, you know, she says I was never in favor of abortion and all that. But she kind of gets taken in. Why? Because she wants women to advance out in the professions because she's worried about the problem that has no name. The feminine mystique, women being miserable, not all women, mm -hmm. but some bit of women being miserable and, and, and dependent in their own homes. Right. So she's so so she's pulled in by these guys saying, look, if you want to be in the workplace, you got to have abortion. You got to have access to abortion. And so there's this shift to that kind of Ginsburg esque view of liberal citizenship of entry into the workplace, but without children. We can't have the burden of children of caregiving, the messiness of what it is to be a mother and now a, you know with generationally speaking, fully engaged father who needs flexible work who needs to be able to, you know, take really seriously those duties of care. And I think that's been a real problem. I think that's been a setback for um, for the women's movement for the last, um, you know, couple of decades, few decades. Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I got from the book is I had gained a more um, greater appreciation for um, Betty Friedan. I mean, her, her she's mm. a complex person, right? Um, she, she had a lot of, you know, rich thought, which changed over, over time. Um, but I think, you know, one of the points you're making is that I, I think that the, the, the modern um, feminist movement has maybe been hijacked by, you know, late capitalism, right, by the needs of of corporate America and the needs, you know, to increase GDP. Um, uh, is, I mean, is that is is that a, a fair summary of of one of your conclusions? I think that's absolutely a fair summary. I think that there's a way in which we have this vision of equality that is very um, kind of emaciated. It's like this idea of market equality. So long as kind of, instead of us taking seriously that first idea of nationalization for women of like the work of the home, it's like everybody has to be a breadwinner now. And then we have this assumption that children are kind of warehoused all day. And so we need more and more money for daycare. And I don't think that's exactly what parents want for their children. And it certainly isn't what upper, you know, and middle class um, uh, families are doing for their children, right? And so there is a way in which we've just basically allowed for the needs of the market to really, I think, inform what um, the feminist movement has requested, right? For, and so there's a way in which like economic libertarians and kind of these I think like kind of push this push for market equality, the girl boss kind of feminists have sort of joined arms <laughs> in fighting for these things. Now, there are women, you know, who wouldn't agree with me entirely on my position who have very much um, been pushing back against this idea, um, you know, wanting sort of care work to be taken more seriously, um, have, you know, there have been relational feminists, care feminists, dependency feminists, who have been critiquing kind of this liberal view of citizenship, kind of of autonomy for decades and decades. And I've learned tons from many of them, Robin West, um, Eva Fetter Kitte, and all of those, those uh, great kind of um, feminist theorists of sort of a different kind of, uh, that have been pushing against, a, against sort of autonomy as the be all and end all. My worry is that they haven't brought care, like the real requirements and demands of care far enough into their thought. And so, for instance, you know, there's, I really, you know, Anne-Marie Slaughter, I think has done great work in trying to like shift the conversation with her article many years ago, women can't, still can't have it all, but thinking a lot about care work. But th the problem is, is that care work is still always thought about as somebody else doing the care, right? And so we're, so it's like, who are the care workers? They're daycare workers. When I, I really think, I mean, if you look at the polling and um, look at American Compass polling on, on in terms of, you know, class, in terms of, um, you know, socioeconomic class, a lot of middle class and lower middle class women 
um, and men too, would rather have someone in the home caring for children. And so I think because of the flexibility of upper class work, because of professional work, kind of laptop knowledge, laptop knowledge work, there's a way in which upper class people um, and professional people, myself included, can kind of have a professional work and so not realize the massive burden that, um, you know, women in other classes, lower classes who have, you know, just in time scheduling, who have all sorts of um, requirements for them to get back to work, who don't have enjoyable work and would much rather be with their children. I'm not saying that these women are concerned about, these people are concerned about poor women. They absolutely are. I just think we need to listen more to those who would prefer to be in the home and prefer to be caring for their children at home, would prefer to see the work of the home that both mothers and fathers engage in as having great value, as you know, getting back to the Wilson Crafting Insight, as kind of, kind of underlying every social, political, and economic good. Um, and that we've kind of forgot about that. And I think thinking about what children really need to become kind of independent, mature, not only workers, not only citizens, but friends and spouses and siblings and neighbors and all of that, I think is a really important shift that, that needs to happen. So, so it seems like, I mean, that, that sort of hollowed out vision is sort of has as its godmother, um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. I, I wasn't <laughs> familiar with her work, but she, that was sort of her vision, right? That you could be a full participant in the workforce and just sort of outsource, right? all of the child care and domestic responsibilities, right? Yeah, that's, that's, a, it's great to bring her up because, so she is this really fascinating figure from, I would say the late 19th century, early 20th century. So she does kind of push, I mean, she, you know, also advocates kind of voluntary motherhood. She advocates chastity. Why? Because of the importance of the child and all that. But she is in her book, William and uh, Women in Economics, she's really pushing for kind of, you know, whereas I talk about how these other women's rights advocates are pushing to keep the logic of cap, the kind of capitalist market, pushing to keep it out of the household to make sure that they can still kind of inculcate virtue within the household. She's sort of like, no, let's bring it all in. <laughs> so let's kind of, you know, have a way in which, you know, efficiency and uh, all of that is informing the way we do household production. So she wants moms and dads. I mean, she really thinks moms are great. She thinks it's like a very high and noble aspiration, but she wants them to, you know, be really um, thinking about kind of loving children and just love, like any type of kind of work and production that happens inside the home, which again is like most of what was going on in the home for a long, long time and still is going on in the home, though, of course, not nearly to the extent. She basically wants to say, like, she wants kitchenless houses, she wants, um, you know, professional daycare class. Um, and, and so everybody can kind of get into the workplace. And so I kind of, you know, make a comment that, that her vision is for another time, um, because it certainly is. It's certainly one that you sort of see um, in some sense in, 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 a, in some version, some kind of version of feminism today, for sure. Now, <clears throat> you end the book with a chapter on, on uh, Marion Glendon, who is kind of, in many ways, like um, a Wollstonecraft of, of our time, right? In, including uh, something of a, of a shared uh, personal history, right? Um, you know, and that she was sort of an abandoned woman early in her life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember reading Wright's talk probably 30 years ago or, or so mm -hmm. and, and really, you know, in, enjoying uh, that book. I mean, but I, I don't think she's, she's seen as mainstream in kind of feminist thinking today. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. So Marion Glendon, for those who don't know her, she is a now retired, so emeritus professor of Harvard Law School, um, and uh, was kind of gained a lot of notoriety in the 1990s with several really important books on the family, um, and and then including Rights Talk. So Rights Talk is kind of her most widely read, kind of popular popular book where she's really critiquing from a communitarian perspective. Um, the way in which Americans always rush to use rights talk in any of their language, almost as any of their arguments, like as a rhetorical trump on everyone else. She was very much part of the then, I think, pretty powerful um, communitarian movement, which was from both the center left and the center right critiquing um, the rise of kind of liberalism, individualism, kind of this autonomy stuff that we've we've been talking about. Right, so, so, the, so the abortion debate is is all about, you know, women's rights versus, you know, unborn 
uh, children's rights. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. And that's actually a, a way in which um, she helps me and then other kind of teachers of mine helped me reframe that I don't really talk about it that way. I really talk about kind of in, in terms of justice or duties of care. What are the duties of care that we owe unborn children, that we owe mothers and all that? I think it's just a much better way to talk about what we're actually talking about when we talk about rights is questions of justice, right? Questions, what do we owe each other? So she she becomes, and, and she's this really important, I mean, she was, you know, tapped by both um, the Carter and Reagan administrations to be um, a judicial nominee, wasn't interested, really um, found, you know, her place in the academy as kind of a scholar because all of her teachers, as she says, were scholars. She was, um, you know, one of the first women, or if not the first woman, I'm forgetting now, on the Ch University of Chicago Law Review. She's really, um, you know, a, a noted um, and really important thinker kind of of human rights and um, uh, comparative constitutional law. I mean, and now really of religious liberty. I think one of the reasons she's now in her 80s, so we don't hear from her as much anymore, but she's still really working on these questions of religious liberty and international human rights. Um, and that's where she really shifted. She did a great book on um, on uh, um, Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, shaping of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So she's not doing as much work maybe in the family. And that's why we don't, we're not hearing from her as much. I'm certainly trying to push forward kind of her vision in this book, because I think you're right. She um, really, because of being abandoned um, when she had her first child and, and unexpectedly becoming a single mother as a practicing attorney, um, she really understands kind of human dependency and interdependency like at her core and so there's a way in which she understands kind of the work of civil society so the family schools churches other kinds of institutions as um as you know building around the individual um institutions of what she calls mutual care and concern that without those you just you can't just have a society that thinks about like the individual and the market and the state. There's this whole realm of the family and family supporting institutions that ought to be around surrounding the individual and the individual's growth within the family. And so that's why she really was able to kind of um, join, you know, hands with people like Michael Sandel at Harvard, Emma Tazzioni, who died recently as part of the communitarian movement in the 1990s, which really informed, I think, Bill Clinton quite a bit um, in his passage of um, the Family and Medical Leave Act at that time and other types of kind of family supportive not as not as much as we need, but at least a push toward family supportive um, legislation. So, look, if you wanted to bring kind of virtue and the cultivation of virtue back into the the conversation, and if you wanted mm -hmm. to uh, strengthen the importance of, of care and and family, I mean, how, how can you do it? I mean, you, you talk about how the the law shapes how we tell our stories and how we we live. I mean, does this is this something that starts with legal? reform or is this something which would start with sort of a change in, in, in the culture and the way in which we, we discuss these things? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that these are, um, you know, mutually influencing, <laughs> always mutually influencing, right? So one of the insights that Marianne and those um, communitarians had is that there's a way in which in America, if you don't have kind of a conscious family policy, if you're not thinking about the family policy, that there's kind of a family policy by chance, and it really is um, sort of uh, uh, libertarian by um, because of not having kind of family within our constitution, because of kind of having rights very much at the center of how we think about ourselves as American, everything sort of shifts towards that kind of self-determining unencumbered individual because of Locke being really foundational to how we think. And so you have to have some supportive family policy because otherwise, but where, where does family where yeah. does family policy live? Like in, in the government, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. we don't have a, a you know secretary of family, right? I mean, we don't have Why not? A department <laughs> of, of family yeah, you know regulation. Right. I mean, is because normally we th we think of it as there's there's private law, right? There's family right. law. That's right. And then you know there's obviously discrimination law, which is sort of at the federal level. But you know where where is policy family policy set? Well, I think in some ways it probably is um, in the IRS. <laughs> I mean, that's where it might start in some sense is like there's a lot of great scholars who are do doing work on how tax policy negatively in fact in influences and impacts, um, you know, uh, how, you know, men and women decide to marry or have children and those kinds of things. So I think the very first thing is like to make sure that there aren't marriage penalties, to make sure that there aren't ways in which um, 
the way I kind of always think about it is that those who are raising children ought not be disproportionately disadvantaged by having children. Right. And so a lot of people will think like, wait, you know, the family, the government shouldn't get, you know, shouldn't kind of put their thumb on the scale in support of families. And it's like, well, other, if it doesn't, it's really putting their thumb on the scale of kind of the individual. Right. And so I think if we want to, it's not so much, I'm not in favor of this idea because I don't think we've seen a lot of um, uh, evidence that it works of like paying people to have children. I don't think there's kind of, uh, I'm not a pro-natalist in that way, that if you give lots of money, then people will go out and have children. But I do believe that if you have a more just structure that, um, that you know, whether it's a family allowance or whether it's, you know, a refundable tax um, deductions or whatever it is where people, because they have far more economic burdens when they bring, when they are raising children, then they, then the tax policy should really be um, weighted sort of in favor of giving them some help, right? So it's not an issue of welfare, it's an issue of justice. And I think that's a really important thing for kind of libertarians to see is that if you want families to form, they, they have to be economically capable of doing so. There's a lot of debate around this right now. You know, is it just people's uh, decisions, economic decisions that are keeping them from having as many children as they like, you know, and, and all of that. And I'll leave that to kind of the policy experts um, who are really debating the numbers. But I just think there's, at least culturally speaking, we're hearing that people aren't having as many children as they want. There's a lot of, um, there's there are economic levers to pull here. However, I think there's a lot of cultural level le levers to pull. And that is, I think that there's a way in which, you know, we have become, <laughs> um, sort of like a consumerist culture in which we're most interested in kind of, you know, the next great, you know, material advantage in terms of tech or um, really being able to kind of be unencumbered and do whatever we want. And we, and I think we discount those who are single and haven't yet had children. They discount the really, I don't know, just incredible purpose and meaning raising children both brings to their lives, but also how it matures us as human beings. So, you know, how do you talk about virtue and care? I think I'd love to see more use of the word virtue. You know, we usually think of it as like virtue signaling and not a positive way, but I think it always has to be defined. And so when I say virtue, I usually right away talk about human excellence, whether it's moral and intellectual excellence and why do we want to be excellent? Virtue is basically like excellence in a human being. And so if you think about it, we want to be excellent in, most of us want to be excellent in everything we do, right? You want to be excellent at your work. You want to be excellent if you're like a kid playing soccer. You want to be the best, you know, you want to be excellent. So you do, you, you, you know, take on the kind of disciplines that allow you to become excellent. So if you want to be an excellent piano player, if you want to be an excellent soccer player, you have to take on those really difficult disciplines of becoming excellent. And I think the same is true in becoming an excellent human being. That, and that's what virtue really does, is it really cultivates those human appetites that we have toward kind of our highest end, right? Toward being these kind of, you know, rational creatures who are, um, you know, I think ordered really to goodness and truth and beauty and friendship um, and really caring for one another, carrying out those responsibilities we have to one another. Um, and so that's what really virtue is, you know, when we, when we're just, we're making sure that we're giving each, you know, his or her due, what they're owed, you know, um, when we're temperate, we're making sure that we're not like eating that fourth cookie, right? But we're making sure that our lower bodily appetites are not ruling us, but we're really governing them, right? You know, when we're courageous, we're not, you know, we're looking at the fear and we're going ahead anyway, but we're not being intemperate about it, right? So, I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which like learning, you know, Aristotle's account of virtue, not even a religious account, right? But Aristotle's account of that golden mean and trying to find ways to um, inculcate in ourselves, especially in inculcating in our children, those kinds of virtuous habits, I think would allow us to be much happier people than we, than we are today. So, I mean, do we have to get to the point where if you ask someone, a young person, you know, what they want to do when they grow up and they can say, I want to be a, you know, good parent or good 
spouse that, yes. that is not seen as an inadequate answer <laughs> that is seen as a yes as a that's right as a legitimate uh legitimate pursuit right yeah that's right and, and actually let me just add to that that one of the things that i think feminists for a long time have had to do in the workplace or women have had to do is they've had to like hide their responsibilities at home right like oh what i would prefer we did was for men to start talking about their responsibilities at home and what they did with their kids and how much they love being with their kids because frankly <laughs> men do love being with their kids at least the ones i know you know and how much the, and, and you do see this again, I think, you know, I, I see it on LinkedIn speaking, profiles now where yes, pe people will say, good. you know, occupation, dad. You know, yes, exactly. And that's yeah. just awesome. And that's just awesome because I think more and more time men are spending with their children and it, it frees women up to say the things that they would want to be saying anyway about their children. And it frees men up too to seek more flexible workplaces for their own responsibilities at home. And that, so that women can be free to do the same. I mean, I think I think that's where people like Anne-Marie Slaughter and others are right, that if you were to like sort of have a whole culture um, that sort of, you know, started to prioritize care and care work in the home too, like caring as mothers and fathers for their own children, that, that women would be much freed from having to hide those things about themselves. I mean, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? This, you know, woman who sort of iconic feminist, right? She had to hide that she was a mother at law in law school. She didn't, you know, she, I think, didn't get work immediately because she was a mother, you know? So I think those are the kind of things that certainly both left and right, or at least center left and center right, um, could come together to really um, work toward is a, is, a, is a culture that really sees those duties of care, responsibilities of care in the home as something that is not only kind of important for our like civilization, but also sees it as really edifying personally as something that um, really, I think, you know, allows people to really find a lot of purpose and meaning. And, and the other thing that it does too, is it creates communities of those people who are raising children, because who wants to raise their children alone, right? You want friendships with parents, other parents who are doing the same, because it's hard work. It's very hard work. And so you want mentors, you know, you want others who you look at them and you say, wow, you raised some great kids. How'd you do it? And you spend some time with them. I mean, all those things are layers that, you know, when people talk about the care infrastructure, it can't just be about policy and, enough, and daycare workers being, you know, equal, you know, paid better. All is great, right? But it has to be about the care that we take, the nurture, the commendation of parents in the home, and that that work is really, really important, and that the economy exists for the work they're doing, not the other way around. And I would love to see that kind of shift in, in how we talk about things. Yeah, and I think, you know, we're seeing some trends, at least in the employment environment, where companies are becoming more, you know, the competition for good employees is getting pretty tough. And so they're competing on flexibility, right? Yes. And so, yeah. So I think, you, you know, it's enabling a different type of career path, right? Where you don't have to start your career by, you know, working 16 hour days. You can maybe start your career with a less demanding work schedule and then kind of, you know, smooth it out a little more over your, over your lifetime, particularly because we're living longer. So there's no, no urgency, right? In yeah. the early years to, to become the, the partner and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I'd love if employers would ask like people who have, you know, those quote holes in their resumes, you know, ask them what they were doing. Were you playing video games? Probably not. Were you caring for people? Tell me how that work of organizing a household, of caring for children, of all the different work that mothers and sometimes stay-at-home fathers do or part-time, whatever, how does that, how did that change? How does that make you the kind of person that I want to hire? And I just think that's a great question to ask because I'll tell you, people would know, people would be able to say it. And why hide that? Why hide that incredibly formative time in people's lives, you know, I think it's, I think it would be great to see more and more of that. I think you're right that you're seeing it in competition for people like in the tech sector and certainly, you know, more in kind of among pediatricians, Claudia Golden kind of talks about this, right? But we got to see that among um, those with, you know, wage, doing wage labor, you know, because that's where there's not flexibility. There's this just in time scheduling that should be like, outlawed in every state, you know, um, and, and so that we can allow those, you know, those men and women who um, are working multiple jobs, who are trying to figure out how to make ends meet, to be able to spend time with their children, to do all the things that, you know, those who, um, you know, have more cushy jobs are able to do and really are able to prioritize. And I think that's got to be something that we see our, you know, put our eyes on in, uh, in policy, especially. Well, Erica, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, the book is called The Rights of Women. It's it's a wonderful book. Uh, check it out. You've got some other books here. Uh, I've got this one from way back. It's called The Cost of Choice. Um, 
And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. I really appreciate it. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 